Today on Blue 58, we take a look at two resource-heavy position groups, offensive line and defensive back. The Packers have worked to stabilize these groups for a long time. Did that work finally pay off in 2019? Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I am your host, John Meerdink. Happy to be with you here for another episode. Do apologize on this one. I'm dealing with a little bit of a cold, so if I sound a little bit crusty a, a couple times during this episode, I apologize. We're going to try to get through it uh, as best as we can. I don't think it's going to be a huge issue, though, because we've got some exciting stuff to talk about. How do you not get excited to talk about offensive line play? This is a, a, a priority for me this offseason, trying to understand the offensive line a little bit better. Uh, that's something that I, I'm going to devote some time to this offseason. Maybe that will be a focus of some stuff that we do in the future. But offensive line, obviously a hugely important part of your overall team's success. And fortunately, in 2019, the Packers seem to have a pretty good offensive line. In fact, I think this might be the Packers' best single position group from 2019. The success was pretty much undeniable. There were some games where it wasn't as good, but generally start to finish, on balance, I think this was a a pretty impressive group. Some raw numbers for the overall group. Uh, ESPN's pass pass block win rate had the Packers as the best in the league uh, as a collective unit. Uh, According to Football Outsiders, they were sixth in adjusted line yards. That was uh, the, the rushing number that they look at. They were creating a lot of room for running backs. Just a good group overall, and they benefited from a lot of continuity start to finish. There were not many situations where you were dealing with multiple guys having significant injuries, and that definitely benefited the Packers on the whole this year. As we go through this position group um, review, I think we're only going to be talking about guys that, that actually played this year, played a significant amount of snaps. So guys like Cole Madison and John LeGlue will not be part of our discussion here. I also want to make a note of something that uh, that I've discovered over the course of, of doing my research for this episode. Uh, so longtime listeners will know that we developed a metric over the last offseason uh, called PASS, P-A-S-S-S, penalties and sacks in starter snaps. Basically, it normalizes or averages out how many penalties and sacks a given lineman gives up every 65 snaps or so, because that's how many snaps a typical offensive line starter plays per game. And to calculate the sacks that we used in that stat, or to to get the sacks that we used for that stat, I used information from Stats Inc., or what used to be known as Stats Inc. or Stats LLC. Now it is uh, Sports Perform. Um, We use their numbers on their charting numbers to assign sack totals to each of the offensive linemen. But their numbers differ from other charting sites. And that's because I I noticed that uh, because uh, Bob McGinn was doing his position by position review for the athletic and he threw out some of his numbers for the sacks that offensive linemen gave up. So I checked his against stats and then I checked their numbers against sports information solution and there was some pretty wide variance. For instance, Billy Turner, according to Stats Perform or Sports Perform, uh, gave up just three and a half sacks in 2019. But according to Sports Information Solutions, he gave up 10 sacks. And according to Bob McGinn, he gave up 12. You see the same sort of thing with Alex Light, who didn't get a lot of playing time this season, but according to Stats Perform, he gave up one sack. According to Bob McGinn, he gave up two and a half. According to Sports Information Solutions, he gave up four. Bob McGinn had Lane Taylor not giving up a single sack this year, but both of the other two outlets had him giving up one. I'm not saying that any one of these is right or wrong. I'm letting you know which source we get ours from when we're looking at this stuff, but I do do want to point it out as another data point um, for the argument that you should look at as many sources as you can when pulling together these evaluations. We need to be holistic in doing stuff like this as often as we can. Get as much data as you can from as many different sources as you possibly can 
as you compile your opinions on things. So with that in mind, let's talk through some of these linemen and defensive backs. We'll get to that eventually too. I do want to point out as we go into this episode too that we have a lot of guys to talk about in this one. So if we don't go into as much depth on a particular player as you might like, let me know and we can talk a little bit more about them. I think we have time to do each of them justice though. Starting with Jared Veld here, who played 35 regular season snaps for the Packers, uh, just a hair over 3% for the total season. This was a great late season addition for Brian Gutekunst, I thought, and I think just the fact that he was able to step in and, and perform at a reasonable level just shows how important offensive line depth is. Because without Jared Veld here, the Packers would have been relying either on Alex Light at right tackle in the playoffs or Billy Turner at right tackle, with Lucas Patrick taking over probably at right guard there. That would not be ideal against any team, much less the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, but they didn't have to do that because Jared Veld here was around. I would be surprised if he is back as a starter in 2020. We've talked about this a little bit before, the possibility of the Packers moving on from Brian Bulaga, going with Veld here instead. I wouldn't necessarily be, a, be opposed to having him around as like a swing backup tackle, but I don't think there's there's much reason to think he's going to be good for a whole season at this point. Still, a good pickup for the Packers in 2019. They got about the maximum I think you could reasonably expect to get out of Jared Veld here in 2019. Next up, Lane Taylor, who played over just who played just over 10% of the snaps in 2019, 114 his final total. Now the writing was kind of on the wall for Lane Taylor from the moment the Packers drafted Elton Jenkins. It seemed pretty obvious that they were going to go with Jenkins at some point this year, and thanks to the biceps injury, that came pretty early in the season for Lane Taylor. This is probably going to be it for him in Green Bay. The Packers will save about four and a half, four point six million, four and a half million by releasing him this off season, if that is something they decide to do. And I think there's good reason to think that they will. Uh, but if they if they go that route, uh, don't let that be your last memory of Lane Taylor because he is a great undrafted free agent story. Very stereotypical, what they call bad body guy. He, he doesn't look like an exceptional athlete, even though as a professional athlete, he is by definition an exceptional athlete. Uh, kind of a long shot guy to make it in the NFL, not coming out of the most decorated of college programs at Oklahoma State. But now he is headed into his eighth year in the NFL. I would expect that he probably will land somewhere in some capacity. Even if he was never like a Pro Bowl caliber talent, I think a great signing by the Packers and a great run in Green Bay for Lane Taylor, if this is indeed now the end. Lucas Patrick is the guy the Packers will be going with for guard depth going forward instead of Lane Taylor. He played 137 snaps this year, just under 13%. Uh, it's stereotypical brawler type, uh, not necessarily the most refined or polished of offensive linemen, but he gets it done seems to me exactly like what you'd want out of a backup guard. He can do it both at guard and center. Has a little bit of nasty to his game. Again, not the most polished guy, but that's what you get for a backup offensive lineman. If you find a decent one, you might as well pay to keep him around, and that's what the Packers have done. Alex Light is the next guy up. 151 snaps for the former undrafted free agent out of Richmond. 14% on the year. I think Alex Light is good evidence for two things. First, how rare quality tackle depth actually is. And second, how willing teams are to try to find it wherever it may be. He wasn't outstanding in limited action in 2019, but you can see what the Packers were going for here. Big, long guy, has the physical attributes at least that you look for in a tackle, but it just doesn't seem like he can get it done at the NFL level. And that's not an indictment. I, I think so much of Alex Light is just a reality that there aren't very many quality non-starter offensive linemen in the NFL. And that's why you see teams constantly churning their backup linemen. They're just trying to find somebody who could step in there and play at an NFL starter level should that become a necessity. Not sure Alex Light is going to be that guy. Maybe Yash Nyman kind of fills the Alex Light role in 2020 as they sort of look to develop those backup offensive lineman types. You might as well keep taking swings, though, even if it is an undrafted guy out of Richmond. As we move into the category of guys who actually started significant games this year, we talk about Brian Bulaga. 
898 snaps for Brian Bulaga out of Iowa this year, 83%. Again, really solid. Circling back to our penalties and sacks and starter snaps this year, he had uh, the second best figure of his career in that metric. He just he gave up just 0.62 sacks and penalties per 65 snaps. Only better season than that was 0.52 for Bulaga way back in 2016. I think unless he is looking for a big payday, you probably want him back. And I think you can probably get him back at $10 million a year or so or less. Potentially, that is a big ask to ask Brian Bulaga to say, hey, would you take $9 million a year for three years or something like that? Uh, but I think there's a good chance that the relationship between Bulaga and the Packers kind of gets that done. Um, there has been some stuff going around on, on various Packers internet circles about what a Bulaga extension could mean for the overall cap picture. Uh, I think the gentleman who puts that stuff together does pretty pretty excellent work. I'm a little bit skeptical of anybody from the outside of the organization putting together firm estimates on what, one, a contract could look like for anybody, and two, what it's actually going to mean for their overall salary cap picture. Well, let's wait and see before we decide exactly how much money the Packers have to spend or what moves they will end up doing. Um, but I think I think that is a good starting point to look at. The Packers, regardless of how much money they actually have to spend on free agents and their own guys this offseason, the overall point that it's not really that much, I think, is a good one. So they need to be judicious here, and they shouldn't go breaking the bank to bring back Brian Bulaga. But if they can get it done for a reasonable number, I think he should come back. Even understanding that he has had his fair share of injuries, more than his fair share, and uh, he will be on the wrong side of 30 heading into 2020. Even if he only has one good season left and maybe one season where he plays eight or nine games, I still think you'd take that uh, on like a three-year deal where the third year actually isn't really part of the contract anyway. But uh, it's not my money, so we'll see what the Packers actually do. Corey Lindsley played 950 snaps for the Packers in 2019, just over 88%. Not a lot to say about Corey Lindsley because he was just Corey Lindsley again. Dependable, penalty-free, doesn't get beat up. He did have a bit of a back issue in 2019, which is a bit concerning because those never really seem to go away. For the bigger guys, offensive linemen, you just you, you get a back injury and you just have a back injury forever now. Uh, he did have the first like ever time I can remember Corey Lindsley seeming to have a bad game this year. The first time around by San Francisco, he just seemed to get handled by everybody they threw at him. And that that's not necessarily an indictment of Corey Lindsley because the San Francisco defensive front is really good. Um, but he, he got worked in that one. And uh, there's nothing, there's no real two ways about it. He just got, he just got beat. But overall, uh, a good season, I think, for Corey Lindsley. He was number one in ESPN's pass block win rate among centers in 2019. And I think he'll be in good shape to be the Packers starting center in 2020. But let me just throw this out there. If for some reason the Packers decided they really wanted to shake things up on the offensive line, they could save about $8.5 million on their 2020 cap by moving on from Corey Lindsley, either via trade or just releasing him outright. So say there was a hypothetical situation where you wanted to keep Brian Bulaga, a tackle who's probably more valuable than a center, but needed some space to do it. Corey Lindsley could be that guy. In theory, that would leave you with an offensive line left to right of David Bakhtiari, Elton Jenkins, Lucas Patrick, Billy Turner, and then Brian Bulaga. If you're wanting to avoid disrupting your offensive line as much as you possibly can, that could be one way forward. If you think the tackle is really more valuable than center, I tend to think so, that could be a way forward as well. I'm not saying that's likely. I'm not saying it's something the Packers would even consider, but it is an option available to them. Sticking with interior offensive linemen, Elton Jenkins played 964 snaps for the Packers this past season, just over 89%. I think he was everything you'd want from a rookie. There was some bumps in the road for him, but that comes with the territory of drafting a rookie offensive lineman. 
He's a good athlete. He finished eighth among guards in pass block win rate from ESPN. His pass figure was .61 this year, third worst on the team, but still pretty solid for a rookie guard. David Bakhtiari started a bit slow in 2019. He ended up playing almost every snap for the Packers this year, 1,075 snaps. Again, started slow. The reason why has never really been clear. He was dealing with a little bit of a back issue early in the season. It's not clear how long that that lingered. Holding was a point of emphasis for the officials this year. It's not clear if they were getting him because of that. Either way, it was a poor start for him this year. But down the stretch, he was a lot better. And it's, it's worth pointing out that the Packers were playing worse teams, too, in the second half of the season. But he played really well. And he finished first among tackles in ESPN's pass block win rate metric as well. Finally, Billy Turner played one more snap than Brian Bulaga. 1,076, 99.81% for Billy Turner this year. He was charged with a bunch of sacks, as we pointed out. It does depend who you ask, whether it's Bob McGinn, uh, Stats Perform, or Sports Information Solution. Um, But I think he was a reasonably solid pickup for the Packers, at least in comparison with their previous right guard experiments, Byron Bell and Jari Evans. I think you can have a good conversation about whether or not signing him was the right move, though. And it's a good example of the question of process versus results. So that's the two-part decision rubric that we always talk about. You judge the process and you judge the results. The results were not necessarily pretty for Billy Turner in every facet of his game in 2019. He did give up a lot of sacks. He, Even if you go with the lower figure of three and a half sacks, there were probably some situations where even in those numbers where he wasn't charged with a sack that you probably could say that he negatively affected the passing play. So from that perspective, he was perhaps not really that much of an upgrade over Byron Bell or Jari Evans because they were not necessarily dominating pass blockers either. I think the, the, the process here is defensible because the Packers did need to upgrade the offensive line. They didn't necessarily sign a market-breaking contract here with Billy Turner. And even if he is just an average to slightly below average offensive lineman, I think you still take that if the rest of your offensive line is pretty solid. If you're going to swing and miss on the offensive line, you might as well do it at a guard spot because I think you can hide those guys easier than you can hide tackles for sure, and maybe even a center. That's just my theory. Um, I think it's worth rolling the dice on a guy like this, though, if you're not going to break the bank on a contract. And look, the Packers can probably get out of that contract here, uh, not this offseason, but the next offseason too, uh, with uh, with minimal damage to the overall, overall cap. Uh, free agents. We've capped off each of these position reviews by looking ahead at free agents that might be available or of interest to the Packers. This is a tough one because I I think this is like defensive linemen in that the guys who are actually getting to free agency are either old or bad or hurt or some combination thereof. I mean, just look at Jared Veld here. Why did he end up in free agency? Uh, first with the Patriots because he was old and coming off some injuries and then why did he end up on the on the free agent scrap heap again? Well, he was he was old. He decided that he didn't want to be retired anymore. Generally, you have to be on the uh, the wrong side of thirty to decide you want to retire in the NFL. That's when most guys, most guys decide to do that. So, all that to say, I, I'm not super interested in most of the free agent market for offensive linemen. I will circle back to Brian Belaga. I think you sign him if you can. He might be worth more to you than to another team. Um, So I think you you probably should make an effort to sign him. You should go in with a number in mind that you don't want to spend more than, but I think up to that number you can be fairly aggressive trying to bring him back. Other than that, though, I think this is a situation when you look at the overall construction of your roster where you're either going to be drafting guys or hammering the undrafted free agent market. I support either one of those things. Even if you're drafting offensive linemen every year, I don't think that's necessarily a bad idea. I'm of the belief that you need to be refilling your offensive line pipeline every single year, be adding prospects, adding talent to that that pool. 
Uh, because if you take care of your offensive line, chances are it's going to take care of you back. If you can get at least four solid starters there, not even like exceptional players, just guys that can come in and, and fill a position and perform at a competent NFL level, it's going to help your offensive situation as a whole. Bob McGinn says he was surprised that the Packers drafted Cole Madison. If that's a surprise to you, I'm not sure that you really have a good grasp on how teams need to be constructed in 2019. If you can't see the case for drafting a guy like Cold Madison, I, I, I got nothing for you here. You want guys that can do multiple positions. You want guys that have the athletic ability to potentially play tackle in the NFL, even if they're lining up primarily at guard. Even if Madison doesn't work out as a player, you can see the process there. And I think that process is something that the Packers need to be working again and again and again. And really, just any NFL team needs to be doing that. Add as many pieces as you can to your offensive line. It'll help you overall. For something completely different, let's talk about defensive backs. I was pretty pleased with the defensive backs overall as a group in 2019. They did give up a lot of big plays, but I think they stabilized down the stretch too as Mike Pettin kind of settled into this year's defensive group. Let's go like offensive line, fewest snaps to most snaps this year, starting with Kadar Holman. He played all of four snaps on defense this year. And to be honest, I kind of forgot at multiple points this year that he was actually a player the Packers drafted. I had him penciled in mentally as an undrafted free agent. Nope, he was a draft pick. I, there's not a lot you can say about him in 2019 because the four snaps there uh, kind of put a, a pretty low ceiling on the, the amount of discussion you can have about him. However, I think he is a good enough athlete that it's worth taking another look in 2020, much like the Packers did with Tony Brown in 2019. He kicked around on the roster for most of 2018 and ended up playing 47 snaps for the Packers defense in 2019, just over 4.5%. Sooner or later, everybody who's on your roster is going to show you exactly who they are. And as it turns out, that was pretty early on for Tony Brown. He was a penalty magnet in 2019, 2018, excuse me, and he went on to again be a penalty magnet again in 2019, and now he is no longer a member of the Packers. That's pretty much the Tony Brown story. Raven Green ended up playing just 70 snaps for the Packers in 2019. I think he is the biggest what-if in the Packers secondary. Would they have seemed so bad, the Packers defense as a whole that is, for almost two months if Raven Green didn't get hurt against the Vikings in week two? It seemed to take eight weeks for them to figure out what to do without him. Or... It seemed to take that long until they were finally confident Ibrahim Campbell was at a point where he could actually fill in because they went with uh, with Will Redmond in the meantime and he did not work out so well. What if Raven Green hadn't gotten hurt and he had been just able to go the distance there until Ibrahim Campbell came along? Maybe the complexion of the Packers defense looks a little bit different. At the very least, they've got a guy there that they feel confident in and who showed them that they should feel confident in him uh, throughout the preseason and through parts of last season as well. I don't think you can say the same for Will Redmond, and he got put into some bad situations as a result. Next up is Josh Jackson, whose 103 snaps were very disappointing for a second-round pick in his second year in the NFL. To me, the only question at this point seems to be whether you cut him now or cut him later. If you want to try to trade him, that's fine. You're not going to get a whole lot. He was extremely disappointing in 2019. Um, he couldn't get on the field, and when he did get on the field, opposing passers completed 85% of the throws they sent his way. Worst on the Packers. It's easy to see why he was not out there. Uh, his athletic limitations are fairly clear at this point. He does not have the the juice to make the plays on the ball that he did in college. It just doesn't seem like this is a situation that's going to work out for Josh Jackson at all. Next up, Ibrahim Campbell. 187 snaps for Mr. Campbell. He is fine as far as I am concerned. He might be a little bit too much of a security blanket player for Mike Pettin. Uh, he didn't play him a ton down the stretch, but he played him more and leaned on him more than perhaps he probably should have. And I realize there may not have been anybody else that he could have put in there instead. 
But it seems like a lot of the Packers' defense in the back half of the season relied on guys like Ibrahim Campbell holding down larger roles than they probably should have uh, been asked to do. His contract told, so he is back for at least training camp with the Packers in 2020. Tolling means that basically your contract didn't count for 2019. He got paid and everything, but he didn't play enough games for it to count as an accrued year, so it just rolls over into the next year. It's fine. Might as well take another look at him. If you can't find another hybrid type player that you would rather have out there instead, I guess he can be your guy there in 2020. If he, he, if he wins the hybrid safety linebacker blood feud with Raven Green, that is, I guess. If they don't decide to keep him around into the 2020 regular season, I wouldn't be all that disappointed either. Moving on, Will Redmond, he was the guy who ended up being Raven Green and Ibrahim Campbell as Campbell and Green were injured. He did it for about 271 snaps, in fact, exactly 271 snaps this year, and showed definitively that he probably shouldn't be counted on to cover NFL caliber players. That clip from the NFC Championship game that you may have seen going around of Kyle, Hanahan, Kyle Shanahan telling the ref to watch for Will Redmond to commit a holding penalty against George Kittle was kind of symptomatic of his entire season. He was a target whenever he was on the field, and they had a lot of success, opposing teams did, whenever they decided to throw his direction. Uh, hopefully this is someone the Packers can replace heading into 2020 because I don't think that there's any reason to think he's going to be any better in 2020 than he was in 2019. Getting into the, the bigger snap guys, we find Chandon Sullivan, who played 350 snaps in 2019. He might have been the most pleasant surprise among Packers defensive backs this year. And to say a pleasant surprise is probably an understatement because he was excellent uh, in 2019. Among Packers defensive backs who faced at least 20 targets from opposing fat passers, Sullivan had the lowest yards per completion average at 10.9 yards, lowest yards per target average at 3.9 yards, lowest completion percentage allowed at 35.5%, and the lowest passer rating allowed at 34.3. Nice guy to have around. And as we pointed out at the time when he made that nice interception of Dak Prescott against the Cowboys in the first half of the season, he played a role that I think in the past would have been filled by an undrafted free agent rookie. But instead, the Packers had Sullivan, who had a year of experience with the Philadelphia Eagles, who knew what it takes to get it done at the NFL level, and played pretty solid whenever the Packers asked him to do what they needed him to do in the secondary. I'm glad he's going to be, or at least have the opportunity to be back with the Packers in 2020, because he got it done in 2019, and uh, I think he deserves another shot to do more. Tremont Williams is next up here. He played 761 snaps in 2019, just over 73%. He had a great season at age 36, and I've got nothing against Tremont Williams at all. If he can come back in 2020 and be comparable to what he was in 2019, I think that's great, and the Packers should probably look to do something with him if they think that they can get that level of play out of him. However, to what extent do you really want to rely on a 37-year-old cornerback having a good year? Even if it's Tremont Williams, even if there's every reason to think that he can, is that a good strategy for building your roster? I tend to think not. I think you'd rather uh, bring in some younger talent if you could. The question is whether or not you can find some comparable young talent. I think everything being equal, you'd rather have the younger guy, a guy you can have for longer. Even if the Packers think that Tremont Williams can be good in 2020, do they think the same about 2021? Maybe not. Um, there's also the, the chance that he might finally just run out of gas at some point in 2020. Um, all these things you have to consider as you go about constructing your roster. I don't think if you if it came down to it, you'd, you'd like to rely on the 37-year-old. Maybe that's a place where Chandon Sullivan takes on a larger role. We now arrive at potentially the most controversial player in the Packers secondary. Kevin King, 805 snaps for Mr. King in 2019. Mr. Boom, Mr. Bust is Kevin King. He had the most interceptions among Packers defensive backs. He had the fourth best passer rating allowed on the team. 
However, he was also worst among all Packers defensive backs in terms of yards allowed per completion. On average, opposing teams were getting 17.3 yards every time they completed a pass against Kevin King. I don't know if I want to keep having the Kevin King versus TJ Watt debate. I don't know if you can have that debate anymore. Um, I think you can see what Ted Thompson was thinking, training back, picking up the extra draft pick, getting Kevin King, getting Josh Jones, getting Vince Beagle with that other draft pick eventually. That doesn't mean it was a good decision because the outcome has been pretty definitive. Uh, I think Kevin King is not as good as TJ Watt. I think Kevin King was still pretty good in 2019. Boomer bust, though, and that's a bad thing to be as a cornerback. Even if he was pretty good, I think the amount of stuff that he gives up is still reason to be concerned. Uh, he's definitely playing for a big deal in 2019, or 2020, heading into the last year of his contract. I'm not sure he's playing for something in Green Bay, no matter how good a deal or how good a a season he ultimately has. Darnell Savage is kind of the the opposite of Kevin King. Because like Kevin King, the Packers made a decision on draft day that could have some long-term repercussions. Unlike Kevin King, they did not trade back and select Savage. They traded up to get him. As a player... I think he was pretty solid in his rookie season. He played 865 snaps, just over 83%. And I think any year where you're not an active liability for the defense is a good one for a rookie safety. But to circle back to the original point, I think he is a good example about how the larger conversation can and will affect our perception of the player. Because Savage might be good, but he will always have that part of his story being that the Packers traded up to get him. They give up two extra draft picks, in essence trading or spending three picks to get one guy to get Darnell Savage. Should they have just stayed where they were at 30? Select Rashawn Gary or whoever you want to pick at 12 and then just see how the board falls to you at 30. Instead, they move up, they get Darnell Savage, who may be a good player, but there is also that larger issue there too. Obviously, this is a wait-and-see sort of situation, but I do want to point that out as we evaluate him for 2019. Jair Alexander, uh, kind of the the, the 2018 version of Darnell Savage. Packers did trade up to get him after trading back. He played just over 1,000 snaps in 2019. He's he's an easy guy to evaluate uh, because he seems like an open book in so many ways. Uh, He's going to tell you exactly how he feels about everything at any given time. He'll tell opposing wide receivers and quarterbacks about it as well. And I think he took some good and noteworthy steps in 2019. He did still give up big plays too regularly. He didn't make the big plays regularly enough. A couple dropped interceptions there. But I think if you're looking for building blocks for Alexander in 2019, they were there. But you really have to put it all together in 2020. Uh, Otherwise, you start heading again towards that disappointing first-round pick sort of territory. You're not just looking for okay starter among your first-round picks, especially a guy, again, that you traded up to get. Adrian Amos rounds out the defensive back discussion. He played almost every snap for the Packers defense in 2019, 1,036, 99.62%. A big improvement just by way of not being ha-ha Clinton Dix, and that, of course, is a perception thing as much as anything else. But the raw number is pretty good for Adrian Amos, too. Uh, His opposing passer rating allowed was just 85.5. That's pretty solid. Uh, He got his hands on the ball a little bit more in 2019 than he did for most of his career in Chicago. He's a nice guy to have around. Still wish he picked off a couple more passes, didn't drop a couple of those ones in the end zone. But, hey, he can't have everything. And he was an improvement, again, just by not being ha-ha Clinton Dix. He seemed a lot more assignment sure, just didn't give up the big play or take awful angles with the same regularity that Ha Ha Clinton Dix did. Free agents. I think you can eliminate a lot of the free agent pool here for the Packers by starting with what they're not looking for in this free agency class. They're not looking for starting cornerback help. 
they are not looking for a starting safety, and that's good because they couldn't afford either of those things anyway. What they might be looking for is a hybrid safety corner type, a guy who can play a little bit of safety if they want to go with a three safety look, play slot corner, maybe play, play outside corner if they need that, or they may also be looking for one of the hybrid safety linebacker types. One name really comes to mind in this position group as, as a potential fit here. And that's Jimmy Ward out of San Francisco. He's more the the safety corner hybrid type. Um, if you want to look at him as a super upgraded Tremont Williams, I think that would be a good fit uh, for for comparison. Way back in the 2014 NFL draft, he was consistently mocked to the Packers at 21. The Packers took HaHa Clinton Dix there instead, and Ward went 30th to San Francisco. He doesn't really have eye popping stats anywhere you look, but he can do a little bit of everything. And as a result. Uh, he will probably be expensive, but I have vowed to make these sorts of things sort of price agnostic. I would I would take a guy, if not Jimmy Ward, like Jimmy Ward for the Packers secondary in 2020. That's all I've got for you in this episode. If there's a name on the offensive line or among the defensive backfield that you would like us to talk about as a potential um, free agent fit for the Packers, please drop that in the comments on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, wherever you happen to listen, because we're going to be kind of doing a cleanup recap episode of all of the position groups that we've talked about over the past couple weeks on the next episode of Blue 58. So I will take your questions on those things at that time. We've already got a couple lined up. Other than that, I just want to simply ask you, if you like this episode, if you like what you're doing here at Blue 58, just go ahead and share it. Share it with somebody you think would benefit from hearing it, because that'll help us grow the show and reach more people Uh, with our content, which of course would further our mission of helping everybody become smarter Packers fans. Because as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.